In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Like I said before, I've been preaching about having a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that is important because without that, all you're doing are rituals. It doesn't make sense. You will get burned out. And you'll wonder why bad things happen. You won't know what God is doing because it's for a relationship. And you won't understand that God is real. He becomes something elusive that you have to go to a church and some priest will talk about a God that existed 2,000 years ago. No, it's real. As real as you and me are right now and more real than that. But here's the problem. Like I said before, to the pure, all things are pure. What do you find that in Titus? So what I'm preaching to you, instead of it gaining an understanding and a relationship with God, it should never act as something could, that condemns you. But all that depends on your worldview. Because you can say one thing, but depending on how you view it, do you understand? See, this is not actually a good example, but once there was a, these candies were popular. They looked like chocolate, but they were chili inside. Covered, chili covered with chocolate, okay? So when you gave it to a person who's not e used to eating hot food, they would taste the chocolate and they would have the chili and they spit it out. I would think, I'm thinking I'll have the same reaction if I give it to my grandfather. So I gave one to my grandfather. He ate it and he said, this is really good, give me more. I'm like, huh? That's not the expected outcome of that. He really, really liked that. So I ended up giving him all my trick candies. Yeah, he cobbled them all up, saying it's good. So finally, it's candy that's spicy, yeah? I guess, uh, to each his own, yeah? But what I'm trying to say is that what God means and speaks, we understand based on our worldview of things. If it's full of lies and condemnation, whatever God sees, His goodness will be viewed as something terrible condemning you. And that's what's happening. In other words, there is someone within us that is blocking this relationship with the living, loving God. We are not able to experience that love that God has. I already explained who this can be. But for those who didn't understand, the someone is not Jesus, obviously. Even though this person is with you all the time, and the someone is not the devil, because Believers especially want to blame the devil for everything. I'm not saying he's not to blame. Yes, don't leave him alone, yes. This someone lives with you, eats with you, sleeps with you on your bed. This someone is not your spouse, your wife or husband or your children. I'm gonna talk about this someone but later, but before that, I want to talk to you about Thomas. Not the train, the apostle, yes? Hallelujah, yes? This Thomas knew Jesus. He had a relationship with Jesus, obviously, yes? He walked with Jesus, yes? 
and he loved Jesus, yes? And he was a disciple of Jesus, yes? He was willing to even die with Jesus because when Lazarus was dead, Jesus said, let's go to him. And you know what Thomas said? Yes, let's go and die with him also. Thomas was all charged up as long as he was with Jesus. The same Thomas asked Jesus what he was talking about. What on earth are you talking about? When in John 14, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, yes. Finally, he said that, yes. But he said, Lord, we do not know where you're going or how can we know the way? Because you haven't told us. Then he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, yes. Do you understand? Yes. So this Thomas knew Jesus. But you find that this Thomas was not there with the disciples after the death of Jesus. As far as Thomas was concerned, everything that he believed in was a lie. Jesus was dead. He claimed to be the Messiah. But one of his own betrayed him, yes? If he was a Messiah, if he was God himself, wouldn't he have known? This is what I would think. I'm not saying this is what the Bible says. I'm saying to understand, yes? And one of his core team members, putting it in today's vernacular as usual, had committed suicide after betraying Jesus. Even Peter, whom they looked upon as a leader, said, I'm done with this. I'm going to go back to what I was doing before all this Jesus stuff started. I know many people like that. I'm going fishing. That's what the Bible says Peter did. So it could be that Thomas was afraid. And he wasn't there when all the disciples gathered. And Jesus appeared to those disciples, but Thomas was not there. But Thomas would not believe that Jesus appeared. They thought the disciples were making this up. Eight days later, the disciples gathered again, together again. But this time, Thomas was there. But Thomas had no faith at this time. He said in John 20, 25, the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands and the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So even if it looks like Jesus, I will not believe. I have to touch and see. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. There was no faith in Thomas. Even sight won't do. He had to touch and see, yes? Basically, he had unbelief. And we read that elsewhere, that Jesus could to do miracles because of unbelief. In Matthew 13, 15, he says, Now he did not do many mighty works there because of what? Unbelief. But here, when the disciples gathered together, here, when Thomas was full of unbelief, not even believing, even in the basics of faith, Jesus showed up. Thomas, or Didymus as he's called, means twin. He did not have a twin, not that we know of, but his name means a twin. There is the Apostle Thomas, and there is his twin, Doubting Thomas, because that's what he's known to some of us as. Doubting Thomas or the Apostle Thomas. 
Some call him the doubting Thomas, but he's the Apostle Thomas. We all have this twin. There are the things in our life which want us to seek God, but then there is the doubting side of us. Instead of doubting Thomas, you can add your name. Doubting John. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. Yes? Uh -huh. do, you, do you understand? Yes? In Romans 7, we read that the Apostle Paul had the same problem. He says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. In 15 to 20, Romans 7, 15 to 20. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. But the things that I don't want to do, I do. So what makes me do it? He says, the sin that dwells in me. For I know, in verse 18 you see, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. The sin is the flesh, yes? For to will is present with me. That means I want to do good. I will to do good, yes? I want to say no to that chocolate in the fridge, yes? That is present with me. But to how to perform what is good, I do not find. I can say no to everybody in the house, but I can't say no to my tongue, can I? Because no man can tame the tongue. Do you understand, yes? For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, not that it is evil taking chocolate, yes? Yes? The evil that I will not to do, that I will, I don't want to do, I just, that I practice. Practice means what? Do it over and over and over and over again. It's not like that I fall into. It says that I practice. Do you understand? Yeah? Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So, here's the thing. You can't say the sin made me do that. Because as you read this late on further, you understand there is a solution for that sin. But here, Paul is identifying what makes him do what he doesn't want to do. That is sin. So you can't say the sin or the devil made me do it, yes? In other words, the twin is called sin. There's a part of us that walks with Jesus willing to die for him like Thomas. There's a part of us that comes to church singing hallelujah and praise the Lord. There's a part of us that shows others who we are, who we are. In other words, a facade. But then there's reality. That we consider reality. There's a twin. There's a part of us that is sick and tired of believing and not seeing. That is fed up with everything that has to do with Jesus, including praying. There's a part of us that if we do not keep in check, will jump out and destroy us and everything that we love. And this part is called sin. And this is what I face as a pastor when I minister to people. Policemen say that they see the worst of people because they see people on the way to jail. I see people who are part of the society who pretend to be nice but I see the devil in them. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you have the devil. Do you understand what I'm saying, yes? 
Paul went through this. And therefore in Galatians 4.19 he said, I labor in birth again till Christ is formed anew. Because he's seeing all this nonsense. He's seeing the worst of humanity in us. When I preach the truth of the word of God, no matter who you are, I can see in your faces. That is why I say, I wish I had a camera here. That's why I'm saying, if you don't keep that in check, and if you don't suppress, keep suppressing that, it'll destroy you. But here's the problem, by suppressing that, by tucking it away in the deep, dark corners of our own soul, we're only nurturing the sin. We're only feeding the sin. That is why darkness, it says in John 1, 3, huh? cannot comprehend the light. 1, 3 to 5, you can read that. Darkness cannot comprehend the light. So that is why bring it to the light and it will flee. When I preach, you can't hide that because you can't hide the truth from the word of God. All those pretenses drop. And you can see the reality of, of who they are and how the word is bearing fruit in their life. The light is the love of the Lord. So how do we deal with what is essentially our old nature? You remember the story about this father whose son was leprous or not leprous, an epileptic fit? And the disciples tried to cast out the demon, they could not, and then finally they went to Jesus and Jesus said, if you believe anything is possible, and the father said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's what the father said. He said, I have unbelief because I'm seeing all this and I went to your disciples and they could do nothing. So I have unbelief. He's being real to them. Thomas said, I will not believe. But Jesus appeared to both of them and came to both of them and helped both of them. Why? Why is that? Because God seeks truth about all in our inward being. Not hypocrisy, not a facade. In Joel 2.13, he says, Rend your heart, not your garments. There was a custom when you hear bad news to tear your clothes. It says, Rend your heart, not your garments. Not your clothes, but your heart. In Psalm 51, it says, Behold, of Psalm 51, 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. The truth is that in sin my mother conceived him. My mother conceived me. David's mother was not in any particular sin, but He's talking about the original sin. And in Samuel it says, God looks at your heart, not at what is outside. So you can't hide things from God. God will see you through who you really are. You may fool others, you may fool me, but you can't fool God. How do you deal with that? David said in Psalm 51, 10, Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Clean, pure, steadfast spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In other words, your heart has to be pure without any hypocrisy or guile. Your faith has to be real. And for that to be real, you have to renew your mind in the Word of God. And sometimes that reality does not include God. And if that reality supersedes the things that God says, 
then do something about it. You have to renew your mind in the Word of God and offer a sacrifice of praise if need be. You have to decide what is of the Lord takes priority, even though everything else seems bigger and better. You have to be living sacrifice. You have to count the cost. So, here's the biggest thing that makes us stumble. You find that in Psalm 73, 1 to 3. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The principle behind this. Basically, don't compare yourself to others. We all have our unique fingerprint, don't we? Suppose you try to fake another person's fingerprint. You'll go to jail, yes? So why are we faking our lives the same way? Instead of living as God intended for us to live, why do we look to others and stumble? Do you understand what I'm saying? Meditate on these scriptures. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as pure in heart. This pure in heart, yes? But as for me, I my feet had almost stumbled. Why? Because I was envious of the boastful. That doesn't mean the wicked alone. That means the Christian also. Are you boasting with what the Lord has given you? Are you turning the blessings the Lord has given you into a curse? Are you using what God has blessed you with to live in sin? You don't have to answer me. But that is the biggest thing that makes us stumble. Don't look at the prosperity of others. This is a problem that I see with each and every person that I deal with or I have to minister to. You compare yourself, not how God has made you, but based on what others have and don't have. You can't live your life like that. You will fall, you will stumble, and you will not have a relationship with God. Do you understand it? You're saying without meaning it that you know better than God. Because had God not made you? Do you understand? Yes? So don't look at the prosperity of others. Be pure in your faith. Like I said in Titus 1, 15 and 16, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. What work? Have you thought about what this is kind of work? Because it says they profess to know God. They come to church, sing hallelujah. Like the son who said, I will go, but I will not go. I will go, but he did not go. Say, I'll come to church, I'll sing hallelujah, I'll praise him. But God declares you abominable. You don't want that, do you? So what does this work? James 2.17 says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. The works by faith. That means there is no faith working in duplicity, in the facade, in impurity. You must have this faith work in you. I told you last week, I spoke to you about Onesimus. He did something with his faith in Christ. But do you remember I 
I spoke about Philemon. I don't know whether it's Philemon or Philemon. I, please use a moan in Christ here. Do you understand? Yes? Philemon received Onesimus as Paul instructed him to. By faith. There was an action because of faith. He just didn't sit simply because of that faith. Did something about it. Same thing with that widow. I spoke about the widow at Zarephath. She did something about the faith. Because of the faith. Same thing with Naaman, the Syrian commander. They all acted out because of the faith. In fact, that their faith prompted them to do things that got them into God's plans. And this is what I want you all to walk into. If you go to Romans 7, we're continuing about what Paul said. And it goes in from Romans 7 to Romans 8. Because Paul in right in chapters or verses. We put those chapters and verses there because it makes it easy for us to have reference. But here's a thought. Paul says in Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Remember this? Yes? Flesh, the, you serve sin. Yes? With the mind, you want to serve God. But who will save me from this? Jesus Christ. Yes? And he continues. There is, in Romans chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. It's all a flow. Jesus Christ saves you if you walk according to the Spirit in what I call de-rascalization, in sanctification. Don't have this facade but here's the problem. Sin goes by other deceptive names. It can even be diplomatic names. You can even compromise on because of sin. You can say something and justify that sin in your life. No, you can't fool God. And you can't fool what God has said. The Bible calls our old nature and the flesh sin. In fact, Paul talks about it in Romans 6, 6 and also in Ephesians about this sin being his old man. That means he's not there now. Old man. The old man was crucified. I put off the old man. I put on the new man. In Romans 6, it talks about the old man being crucified with Christ. Yes? Yes? Do you understand? So you have a way of escape. This is your old nature. This is who you were, not who you are. In Christ, you are a new creation. Amen? So, but you got to want to put this away. In Romans 13, 14, it says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. In other words, overcome this twin in you. Overcome this twin called sin by the resurrection power of the Lord. That's the only way you can overcome it. That is the only way you can have power over it. Because what you need to understand is this in Romans 8, 13 and 14. If you turn your Bible there. Romans 8, 13 to 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Amen? 
as many as are led by the holy spirit spirit of god is the holy spirit are the sons of god so don't say you are the son, child of god if you are doing something else and you're not being led by the spirit of god people will call you hypocrite you know that you you are a hypocrite god won't be real to you you wonder what is going on in your life this is what is going on you don't want god to end up calling you a hypocrite on judgment day do you no so be led start today amen let's all worship him thank you lord hallelujah we shall know the truth and the truth will make us free help us be real to who we are to who you created us to be so that we can be all that we can be because of you in us help us lord live out our faith in you put away all lies and hypocrisy and deceitful ways help us put them all away and come with purity in our hearts the simplicity that is in Christ help us to keep our minds renewed in your word help us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to you holy and acceptable thank you lord that your word says that we open our mouth you will fill it fill it with your goodness with your love we are grateful for that lord that there is no condemnation that we can run to you we can hide and take refuge in you lord thank you for being there for us thank you for being our father in heaven thank you lord that in spite of what we see in ourselves in spite of all the insecurities that we have that you will perfect that which concerns us and that you will give us strength and boldness to face the day to overcome because you are Jesus and we are the temple of the holy spirit and because we are a father in heaven thank you lord hallelujah once again the lord is saying that he will fulfill that which concerns us all we have to do is submit our lives to him as we are not in king james english or in fancy vocabulary you no know, as we are just reach out to him just cry out to him speak to him he is real he will come through for you this twin that i spoke about is dead your old man is crucified with christ jesus that's why paul says put him away put him off and put on the new man for you are a new creation in christ amen 
I can't hear you. Amen. Let's continue worshiping.